Donna, and welcome uh, back, everybody. Um, I will share my screen again. Um, so I've uh, 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 rewritten uh, what we derived uh, last time. Uh, this first line here is uh, our master equation for the gravitational wave background due to astrophysical sources. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, most of this is uh, uh, basically uh, set. F is frequency, of course. Rho C is the rho C zero is the current uh, critical energy density in the universe needed to close the universe. And uh, A zero is the Hubble constant. Um, one plus Z, of course, is just uh, uh, the redshift uh, parameter. The rest in the denominator, this is the matter energy density and lambda uh, is the dark energy uh, um, uh, energy density. So these are all relatively well known. Uh, so really what uh, it, this boils down to is specifying the RV and the EDF. Uh, the EDF is um, uh, the energy uh, spectrum emitted by a single source, single astrophysical source. So that could be a single black hole binary or a single magnetar and so on. And it will uh, uh, vary from a model to model depending on how the gravitational waves are being generated. And I wrote down the, the uh, uh, expression for the compact binary coalescences, which uh, depends on the chirp mass, uh, this particular combination of the uh, component masses of the binary uh, to the power of five thirds and on uh, the frequency as a frequency to the power of minus one third. So uh, this combined with the frequency term uh, out front here gives us that the omega in the CVC case will go as frequency to the power of two thirds. And I, I should note again that this is uh, referring to only the in spiral part of the waveform uh, and it doesn't include the, uh, uh, the merger and the ring down. Uh, and in fact, um, I think I forgot to say yesterday, but uh, um, for the black hole binary case, we actually have the, uh, 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 the full waveform, including the, the, uh, the merger and the ring down uh, that actually comes from one of Ajit's papers. Um, so that, that actually is a, is a more complete um, uh, um, DDF uh, for that particular model. For the binary neutron stars, we don't do that because in the case of binary neutron stars, there is actually matter present. So uh, one has to take into account the equation of state and so on of the neutron star, and that becomes too complicated. Either way, uh, the merger and ring down do not contribute uh, very much in the frequency range in which uh, LIGO and Virgo are the most sensitive. So that's the DDF. RV is the, uh, the rate of uh, sources uh, per co-moving volume. So um, uh, for most uh, sources that uh, come from stars, uh, this RV will be related to the star formation rate. Um, in some cases, like we saw for uh, supernovae and, and magnetars and so on, uh, this is basically proportional to the star formation rate. Um, uh, basically, we're, uh, we, we, we add some sort of a scaling factor lambda, which tells us what fraction of the uh, stars uh, mass fraction, I should say, of stars ends up in uh, in in uh, magnetars or or um, goes through the core collapse and so on. Um, the uh, in the case of uh, uh, compact binaries, there is another uh, complication in the sense that uh, there is a time delay between when the binary is formed and when it uh, merges, and that uh, time delay could be fairly large. Uh, we don't know it very well. Uh, there, are, there are simulations that are trying to address it, but uh, the way we handle it is by assuming some sort of a, a probability distribution for the time delay and marginalizing over it. Um, so as I said, uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, sources, all of the models that have to do with, uh, with astrophysical objects that have uh, stellar origin would uh, uh, have this rate uh, somehow related to the uh, star formation rate. Uh, and star formation rate is uh, uh, at this point relatively well understood, especially at low redshifts below, let's say four or five or so. Um, I wanted to give one more example uh, uh, to complete this discussion of the uh, astrophysical uh, models, uh, which is a little bit different. And that's the primordial black holes or black hole binaries. Uh, and uh, we uh, touched on it at the end uh, yesterday. Uh, but basically, the, re the reason I wanted to mention it is because uh, for that particular model, RV will not be related to the star formation rate. 
simply because the primordial black holes are um, expected to be generated in the early universe uh, as um, uh, through small density fluctuations of, of dark matter itself uh, very early on. So the, uh, the number of uh, these uh, uh, primordial black hole binaries as a function of redshift will be uh, uh, very different in general from the, uh, uh, from the stellar, from the star formation rate. Um, so there are, as I mentioned yesterday, <clears throat> multiple mechanisms in which uh, primordial black holes could uh, produce gravitational waves. Um, and I'll just mention one of them uh, that I was involved in just to give you a, a flavor of how this looks like. But uh, if you're interested, there is uh, quite a bit of literature uh, and rapidly growing literature uh, today uh, on this particular topic. So uh, one uh, possibility here is that um, uh, the primordial black holes are created in the early universe. They are floating around in, in, uh, um, in the halo of various galaxies. And uh, occasionally, uh, the two, two such black holes would uh, interact with each other through gravitational wave emission and capture, create a, create a binary. Uh, and there is a cross-section for that process, uh, which has been evaluated by uh, Mark Kamiakowski and collaborators. Um, and when you take that cross-section, you multiply it with the, uh, the number density of, um, of such uh, uh, black holes in the halo, you can come up with a, a rate. Uh, for uh, 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 for the number of uh, black hole, primordial black hole binaries in uh, in a galactic halo, so um, this is a fairly long equation, uh, and uh, um, uh, so I'm I'm not going to write it all down. You can see it in in the um, in the lecture notes, but basically it's a, it's a function of several things. Um, so uh, things that go in here are the virial mass. So this is the mass of the uh, galaxy within the uh, virial radius, where the virial radius is uh, uh, defined to be the radius in which the, uh, this particular NFW dark matter profile reaches 200 times the critical density of the universe. So you can define the, the, the uh, virial radius, which uh, is arbitrarily chosen to be uh, the, the radius at which uh, this particular uh, dark matter profile model, the NFW model, reaches 200 times the, the row critical. Uh, and, uh, and then there is also the uh, uh, characteristic uh, uh, length scale, which is the characteristic radius for the, for the halo profile. Uh, and of course, there is the, uh, um, the distribution. So I, maybe I should uh, write it as... Uh, uh, um, this is the, the velocity distribution, which is uh, uh, the Maxwellian distribution for uh, particles in this um, uh, uh, in this uh, dark matter halo. So various things go in. Um, you know, we could spend a lot of time discussing this, but um, uh, it would take us a little bit too far uh, astray. So just uh, uh, as a, for the sake of argument, um, Take it as a given that uh, if I give you the uh, 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 galaxy of a particular virial mass and, and particular uh, uh, virial radius and, and the uh, characteristic radius, um, uh, you can compute this uh, halo, um, th this rate of uh, num or the, the number of uh, black hole binaries per, per galact galactic halo. Uh, but what we, what we really want to know is what is RV of Z. And that uh, you can do by integrating over uh, the virial masses. So uh, you write something like this down. So you take the halo rate, and then you multiply it by the halo mass function, which is uh, uh, um, uh, which you can extract. So th this would be the halo mass function. And this uh, can be extracted from, uh, from numerical simulations. And then you integrate over all the possible virial masses of the uh, um, of the galaxies. Um, so the uh, uh, the upshot of it is that uh, there is a different uh, approach to calculating the um, uh, uh, the RV in this case, and it depends on uh, this particular uh, uh, quantity here, uh, basically on the on the number of uh, galaxies at any particular uh, virial mass. Uh, and um, so you can you can basically proceed with the calculation uh, uh, as before. Uh, 
in this case, there is no star formation rate to worry about. You have to deal with uh, this quantity, which you can extract from simulations. There are multiple simulations out there as well. Um, and uh, um, maybe what I will do is just show you some, some results. Give me a sec to, to uh, make that bigger. Okay, so you should be able to see my slide here. And uh, uh, basically what I wanted to show is uh, this plot here on the right, uh, which shows the merger rate. So the rate of uh, black hole binary mergers for these primordial um, uh, models are shown in, uh, in these curves here, uh, various colors and some dash, some, some solid. All of these correspond to different uh, uh, simulations from which we extract uh, the um, um, the uh, uh, halo mass function, uh, as well as uh, the, there are some variations in the actual model of the halo. So the concentration of uh, uh, black holes in the halo uh, can vary from, from model to model. And you can see that this, they're all uh, relatively flat in, uh, as a function of redshift. Uh, uh, in comparison, you see how uh, the stellar uh, um, black hole binaries would evolve with redshift. So the rate here uh, will follow the star formation rate increase up to a redshift of one or two and then decay away. And since these are basically uh, uh, fixed at uh, a redshift of zero by the local rate uh, of observed mergers, uh, necessarily this, uh, the, the gravitational wave background due to um, primordial models will be necessarily smaller than uh, the one due to the stellar uh, so uh, uh, you can you can see in the end how how that uh, ends up comparing in terms of the energy density omega is a function of frequencies. You see that the uh, primordial uh, uh, predictions are about an order of magnitude smaller than uh, what we have for the stellar case. Uh, so again, uh, this is just one of the multiple models. Uh, this one is not particularly promising uh, because it's much weaker than than the stellar case, and uh, we expect that this will be there. Um, and we'll be seeing it in a, in a few years, but um, uh, uh, there are other models of uh, uh, involving primordial black holes that may actually predict significantly larger uh, 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 energy densities, and, and those may be of uh, more interest to, the, um, to uh, uh, the current and upcoming detectors. Okay, uh, so um, Maybe I'll uh, uh, stop here for uh, in case if there are any questions, but then uh, we will move to um, uh, the, to the next topic. Um, who can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes. So uh, my my question is about uh, why we are not including time delays here. So I don't know much about primordial binaries, but uh, I would think that there would also be a, a time delay here or or Am I thinking something there, wrong? There would be, but relative to what? Right, uh, in, the, in the stellar case, uh, we have the star formation rate, which tells us uh, rate is a function of redshift. We have to include a time delay relative to that to get the uh, rate of mergers as a function of redshift. For, uh, for the primordial case, uh, we uh, we don't have such we don't have the star the star formation rate reference right so there's no reference to calculate the, the delay relative to so the the yeah. only thing that so pri so these primordial black holes are formed in the early universe is is that right the the black holes themselves are uh, but the the binaries could be formed at any time during during the evolution. In this particular model, uh, you basically just have to have two uh, black holes that pass by each other reasonably closely so that they can capture. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll, we'll move on to, to our next topic. Uh, so what I wanted to do uh, uh, next is um, uh, talk a little bit about how we search for uh, the stochastic background. Um, and uh, there are, my, my, my motivation is twofold. Uh, uh, on one hand, this will uh, lead us to, um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk a little bit about anisotropies and so on. 
uh, and those are important for the searches for, uh, for astrophysical um, uh, stochastic background. Uh, but also I wanted to, to give you a sense of uh, where we stand in the field, uh, uh, what we do, uh, what, what are the, the kind of um, uh, hot things to do in, in this area these days, um, what kind of approaches we take uh, to, to uh, search for the stochastic background. and. Um, uh, if you're interested in, in maybe getting involved in this kind of research, uh, it will give you a better idea of uh, what you might be doing um, uh, if, you, if you join. So uh, the uh, search for the stochastic background is based on a technique that uh, was first uh, introduced by uh, Joe Romano and Bruce Allen uh, back in, I believe it was 1999 uh, was when the paper was published. And it's based on cross-correlating two detectors, two detector time series. So to start with, um, let, me, uh, let me first write down that uh, uh, what we observe is a, a time series S1 from detector one. That could be, let's say, LIGO Hanford or uh, um, any, any of the existing detectors. And uh, this will have some intrinsic noise to that particular detector and it will have uh, the signal. And uh, so the noise will be noted with N1 and uh, the signal uh, as H1. And similarly for another detector S2, so this could be, uh, if we're choosing S1 to be Hanford, S2 could be Livingston or Virgo or Kagra. Uh, so this will be N2 of T plus H2 of T. Um, and uh, uh, so N1 and N2 are the, the noises of the detectors. Um, as you probably know, uh, the noise of uh, detectors is dominated by some fundamental noise sources, such as the shot noise of the laser or the uh, thermal noise uh, uh, in the um, uh, in the suspensions and uh, and in the mirror coatings and so on. So those um, are uh, expected to be uh, Gaussian processes. Uh, there is um, uh, 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 no reason to assume non-Gaussianity uh, uh, in in N one and N two. And uh, uh, we're expecting both of those to be, uh, to have the uh, um, uh, expected value uh, of zero. So uh, they will be basically, uh, N of T will be fluctuating around zero with, uh, with, the, mean, uh, with the mean zero. Um, the uh, H here is the gravitational wave signal. So of course that will depend on uh, the metric and it will depend on uh, how a particular gravitational wave couples to a detector at a particular time, which uh, of course matters, the time matters because the detector will be located at a particular location and it will have a particular orientation as the earth rotates and so on. So uh, a particular gravitational wave uh, will in general uh, couple to that detector, but the coupling may uh, vary as a function of time. Now, if we assume uh, that we're dealing with a stochastic background, which is Gaussian in nature, HI uh, will also be uh, Gaussian and we can expect it to uh, have mean zero as well. So again, H will be uh, fluctuating as a function of time, it will fluctuate around zero, which means that also SI uh, expectation value uh, will be zero. So uh, what, we're, what we're observing then uh, is, uh, a noise time series uh, in both detectors. Um, the uh, uh, noises, the uh, uh, N1 and N2, we're going to assume that they are not correlated. Um, and uh, the H1 and H2 in principle could be correlated or, sh or should be correlated because uh, they're both uh, related to the same uh, gravitational wave even though the gravitational wave uh, may couple differently to the two detectors. These assumptions of uh, N1 being, uh, um, uh, N1 and N2 being uh, Gaussian and uh, uncorrelated are really assumptions, right? So we will uh, assume that for the time being, go through uh, the, the, the uh, calculation and so on. But keep in mind that uh, both of those uh, might actually fail, both of those assumptions. Uh, and in fact, much of our, uh, when we do the actual analysis of the LIGO and Virgo data, most of our time actually goes into uh, the, the data quality, making sure that the noise is uh, Gaussian, that we don't have glitches, for example, uh, contaminating the, uh, the data and making it non-Gaussian and so on. We also worry about the correlations. Um, uh, such correlations, noise correlations could be in, induced 
uh, for example, uh, one example is uh, mag magnetic correlations due to uh, Schumann resonances. These are magnetic resonances uh, uh, that are around the Earth in, uh, in the ionosphere. Uh, so they could introduce uh, correlated magnetic fields at uh, geographically separated locations. Uh, another possibility is that uh, you have, for example, uh, um, uh, the, the both detectors, let's say one at Hanford, one at uh, Livingston, are uh, they're separated by a thousand kilometers, but uh, they're both synchronized to the GPS. And if you then have a clock that's uh, synchronized to the GPS, uh, those two clocks will be uh, 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 correlated between Hanford and Livingston. So anything that's uh, tied to the clocks, uh, any any uh, physical process that may be tied to these uh, uh, correlated clocks may, in principle, induce uh, correlations between uh, the two detectors. And we have seen this. Um, uh, these have actually happened uh, in, in various searches over the years. All right, uh, so that's that's about the noise. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is uh, we had uh, uh, written down uh, I'll just remind you that we wrote down an expression uh, like this, that the omega GW of F was proportional to F cubed times uh, H of F. H of F here is the strain power spectrum. Uh, uh, this is all in frequency domain, right? But uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that um, uh, if, uh, the, the, the noise here, N1 of T, and its Fourier transform, N1 of F, basically determines uh, the sensitivity of our detectors in frequency domain. So H of F, the sensitivity uh, will be, uh, of the detector will be determined by this noise uh, term N1. And um, if, we, uh, if the uh, omega, if the gravitational wave energy density is louder than this noise power spectrum, then we will be able to observe this uh, stochastic gravitational wave background with that single detector. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, if you take that approach, um, uh, uh, the uh, sensitivity level in, in omega is at the, at the level of about 10 to minus two, maybe 10 to minus three, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but we can do much, much better if we, uh, if we actually try to correlate two detectors. And the reason you might think that uh, correlating two detectors uh, is interesting is because when I multiply S1 and S2, when I actually calculate the correlation, what I will be doing is effectively multiplying H1 and H2. So I will be effectively uh, using the two-point correlation, which is proportional to omega, okay? So we will see that more explicitly, but uh, that's basically where the, uh, uh, that's, that's the insight, if you like, and why a cross-correlation might work well in this case uh, uh, again, that's because in the cross correlation, we'll be multiplying S1 and S2, which amounts to multiplying H1 and H2, which effectively uh, leads us to a two point correlation that we wrote down yesterday or on, on Monday. Um, and that's proportional to, to omega. All right, so let me write down the, uh, the uh, cross correlation estimator. Uh, so we refer to it usually as Y. Uh, so let me write it down first. Um, and um, uh, then we can stare at it. Um, and then we have S1 of T, S2 of T, and we have some filter Q, which is a, a, a this two is a function of T prime, uh, and some filter Q, which is a function of uh, T and T prime. So in this case, we're, uh, we have some period uh, T uh, capital T of data. So we collect the data over some, some time uh, segment capital T. Uh, we have the time series of the first detector, S1 of T. We have the time series of the second detector, S2 of T prime. We multiply them together and then we also multiply them with some filter Q. Uh, a priori, we don't know what Q is uh, and part of our task will be to figure out what is the optimal choice for Q for this filter. But we can already see that uh, if the, uh, uh, the noise is stationary and if the stochastic gravitational wave background is stationary, then uh, this filter really will just depend on the time difference between T and T prime. Uh, the only thing that matters will be, will be the uh, uh, T, T minus T prime. So we will be replacing this with uh, the filter as a function of T minus T prime. 
Um, and again, that's in the, in, under the assumption that uh, both the noise and the stochastic background are stationary. Uh, the other thing that you can uh, uh, perhaps already see is that um, uh, if um, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this Q will peak when T is equal to T prime. Uh, one way to see this is uh, assume that these two detectors are on top of each other. Uh, so they're co-located uh, geographically. Uh, in that case, uh, there will be no time delay between um, the, uh, uh, the signals that observed by one detector and the, and the second detector. Uh, so th the best correlation you would get is uh, if, if you uh, straight multiply S1 and S2 element by element, so without any, any worry about time delays between them, in which case the, uh, the, this filter Q will be um, basically one uh, at uh, uh, when t is equal to t prime and zero otherwise, effectively a delta function. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, if the two detectors are geographically separated, uh, then uh, you might uh, want to uh, uh, include some uh, time delays in, in this filter Q, and we'll see how that comes about. Now, the other thing that uh, you, can, you can see is that if, uh, uh, if uh, uh, if, the, if, if t minus t prime, uh, let's put it in the absolute value, if we take this uh, time delay to be uh, very large, so if it goes to infinity, then the filter will go to, uh, to zero. Okay, um, so uh, this is effectively telling us that um, uh, uh, there will be no cr cross correlation between uh, uh, the uh, detector one today or right now and uh, detector two at the time that's infinitely far away. So it, it makes intuitive sense that when you're looking at the cross correlation, you really should be looking at the two detectors at very close nearby times. Um, so because this is true, because uh, uh, Q goes to zero for a large T minus T prime, we can replace one of these two time integrals uh, with, uh, the ranges we can we can replace with plus and minus infinity. So let me uh, let me do that um, uh, right here, um, just to save myself some writing. Okay. So uh, instead of uh, plus and minus t over two for one of these two integrals, I've uh, replaced it um, with uh, uh, with plus minus infinity. So uh, we now allow t prime to go to plus minus infinity. But because the filter goes to zero uh, at very large uh, t minus t primes, uh, uh, this, this change makes uh, no effective difference. Okay, so then um, th this is our, the definition of our uh, cross-correlated uh, cross um, uh, estimator. And uh, the next thing that we will do is we will move to the frequency domain. So we will Fourier transform everything in sight. Uh, and the Fourier transform just to, to uh, to be uh, uh, explicit, what we will do, we'll uh, uh, use this particular form. Okay, so uh, any function g of t will turn into a g of f, uh, and we will use the, the positive phase e to the plus two pi i of t uh, in the Fourier transform. So let's transform s1, s2, and q from the, the uh, uh, time domain uh, into a uh, frequency domain. So this will then become, um, still write y, we have uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, I will, um, yeah, let's, let's go step by step. So we'll have uh, minus t over two to plus t over two dt, and we'll have an integral from minus infinity to infinity at dt prime. And then we will have three Fourier transforms. So we'll have an integral over f, uh, f prime and f double prime. So I'll just write that as, as uh, one integral, but uh, we'll have df, df prime and df double prime. So then instead of S1, we will have S1 of f times e to the uh, two pi i f t. Instead of S2 of t, we'll have of t prime, we'll have S2 uh, of f prime times e to the uh, two pi i f prime t prime. And uh, the last term will be the filter. So instead of um, q of t minus t prime, we will have q of uh, f double prime times the e to the power minus two pi 
I F double prime times T minus T prime. Uh, sorry, this is a plus here. Um, so uh, now we can uh, uh, simplify this a little bit or, or regroup the terms, I should say. So uh, we will keep the first uh, time, the re time integral uh, as is. Um, we will have uh, uh, the, the, the frequency integrals. So let me write those out as well. And then uh, I will uh, group the terms. So I, I should have been a little bit more careful. Uh, one of these uh, 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 S's I should conjugate uh, just because we're moving to, to the frequency domain. So uh, instead of S1, we'll, we'll have S1 star, and that means we'll have the uh, uh, negative in the, in the phase as well. So um, uh, uh, rewriting again, so we'll have S1 star of F, we'll have S2 of F prime, uh, and then we'll have Q of F double prime. Okay, and uh, uh, let's, let's group the uh, terms, uh, the phase terms uh, in terms of T. So we'll have E to the power minus two pi I F. So this will be F minus F double prime uh, times T. So uh, taking this term and the T term from the last uh, phase. And then finally, we have uh, the last integral over dt prime. Uh, and uh, that will be just over the phase, which is two pi i. And then we have f prime minus f uh, double prime times uh, uh, t prime. Now this piece here is uh, just a delta function between uh, f, uh, delta function of f prime minus f double prime. So I can evaluate the integral over F double prime, which will uh, basically replace in all of these terms, I will replace the F double prime with F prime. So that will simplify my expression a little bit. So now I have uh, two integrals in frequency from minus infinity to infinity uh, of DF and DF prime. And here we'll have S1 star of F uh, S2 of F prime, that still remains unchanged. Uh, Q now becomes a function of F prime. Uh, and um, uh, let's see, uh, and we have uh, the last uh, term is e to the minus two pi I uh, F minus F prime T. Um, so the, uh, um, let me uh, move the, the time integral uh, here. This is a d, dt integral. So I will just uh, erase it from the, from the, from the, uh, from the front. Uh, and the reason I did this is because this quantity uh, looks like another delta function. It's not the exact Dirac delta function because the integration is not from minus infinity to infinity. But uh, it is a, a, a finite time approximation to it. So we, we refer, we'll write this as delta sub t to indicate that this is a final time approximation uh, of f minus f prime of the delta function. And uh, in particular, so let me, uh, uh, let me write that uh, explicitly. So delta t of f minus f prime is uh, uh, this integral from minus t over two to plus t over two of e to the two pi i uh, f minus f prime uh, t dt. Uh, and this uh, you can write as a uh, sine of uh, pi t uh, times f minus f prime. So uh, this is solving, solving this integral divided by pi times uh, f minus f prime. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, when f prime uh, is equal to f, so when f is equal to f prime, this approaches, uh, uh, approaches t. So uh, delta t of zero will be equal to t. And when t goes to infinity, we basically approach uh, the Dirac delta function. Okay, so uh, with this change, uh, we can finally write uh, our y. Uh, again, we, we have these two uh, frequency integrals uh, left over. So integral over df, and over df prime, both of them from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
And uh, we have uh, S1 star of F, S2 of F uh, prime, uh, uh, and Q of uh, F prime as well. And then we have finally the uh, finite time approximation of the Dirac delta function at F minus F prime. Okay, I hope this is, this is clear. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, um, let me see, I, I don't see my, the chat window right now. Let me see if I can open it. No, we don't, there are no questions yet. Uh, okay, yeah. all right, uh, good. All right, so, so this then uh, gives us uh, the expression for our estimator in the frequency domain. And uh, our next task will be to figure out what is the expectation value of this uh, estimator, what's the corresponding uh, variance, uh, and what is Q? Uh, we haven't uh, specified that yet either. So the expectation value of Y will be basically the expectation value of S1 star uh, times S2. Uh, the, the Q will be a, a, a well-defined function of F prime. Eventually we'll decide what that is. We don't know it yet, but it, it's not going to be a random variable. It will be a, a, a well-defined function. So uh, what this is boiling down to is we need to find the, uh, um, uh, the, expect, the expected value of S1 star uh, S2. Now, uh, both S1 and S2 look like N plus H, right? Um, so uh, uh, this will be, uh, I'm, I'm uh, not writing the frequency any more, explicitly anymore and so on, but um, just to give you a sense, uh, so we have N1 plus H1 multiplying N2 plus H2. There's a star here. Uh, and uh, that will give us several terms, right? We'll have N1, N2, we'll have um, uh, star, uh, we'll have uh, N1 star H2, uh, we'll have uh, H1 star uh, N2, and we'll have H1 star H2. So four terms. Now, if N1 and N2 are uncorrelated, if the, the, the noises between um, the two detectors are not correlated, then this term will go to zero. The expected value of it will be zero. Similarly, the expected value of uh, 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 NH terms uh, will also be zero because we're not expecting the noise in, in a detector to be correlated with a gravitational wave passing, passing through. So uh, we're left with this last term, H1 star H2. So then uh, what is H1 and H2? Uh, well, uh, let's, uh, let's remember what H1 uh, or, or maybe I'll write this as HI uh, to, to uh, uh, be fully inclusive. Uh, HI of T will be uh, the signal observed, the gravitational wave signal as observed by the detector I. Uh, and of course that will depend on the metric. So we'll have HAB, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, evaluated at some time T and at the location XI, this is the location of the detector I. Okay, so this here, will be uh, detector I a location. Um, so that's the metric, but then this metric uh, 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 interacts with a, with a detector and uh, the way it, it interacts will depend on the detector orientation and so on. So we contract this with a detector response, DAB, which uh, will also be a function of the uh, time and the position of the detector Xi. So in particular, uh, uh, this uh, D will, um, uh, can be written in terms of the, uh, the vectors uh, along the X and Y axes uh, of, the, of the detector. Okay, so this will be uh, equal to one half, and then I will write these as capital X uh, uh, unit vectors A, uh, and uh, B, uh, XA and XB are the components of the uh, unit vector along the X arm of the detector minus uh, Y A, Y hat A, Y hat B. Uh, oops, not, not uh, sorry, there we go. So uh, X hat and Y hat are vectors along the X and Y arms of the detector. I didn't explicitly write it down, but uh, those unit vectors are also functions of uh, the time and the uh, position of the detector. Uh, 
uh, as the detector moves uh, uh, with, the, with the rotation of the Earth, these unit vectors will be moving in a three-dimensional space. And uh, uh, the, uh, the response of the uh, response tensor of, the, of, of that particular detector, since these are L-shaped detectors, is relatively straightforward. And uh, it, this is what it looks like. So uh, we're taking the uh, product of the A and B components along the X uh, direction minus A and B components uh, along the Y direction. So this is, uh, uh, this is how we, we can uh, uh, identify what is HI. Uh, what is the time series that comes out of, uh, of a given gravitation wave detector? It is uh, given by the, the uh, metric of the gra gravitation wave passing through, contracted with the response of the detector at that particular time and location. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, yes. Uh, could, could you please read why it? Does uh, the term, I, yeah. Why does the term N1, H, N2, H, N1, H1 become zero? Uh, why does this term uh, go to zero? Uh, N1, H2. Uh, so N1 is the noise in uh, uh, gravitational wave detector. It is uh, defined by processes like uh, shot noise of the laser, uh, vibrations, uh, thermal vibrations of the uh, uh, um, of the coating on, on the detector mirrors, um, co uh, thermal vibrations of the suspension wires, things like that, or seismic noise uh, at that particular location. These are in no way related to the gravitational wave that may be coming from billions of light years away. So that's why we can uh, assume that the, the, uh, the product of these two in general would be would be uh, uh, on average would be zero. Does that answer the question? Okay, um, I'm not able to see the chat. Um, yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. all right. Okay, very good. Uh, please free, feel free to speak up. Uh, um, you know, I, I don't know why I can't see the chat right now, but um, uh, yeah, just, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, okay, so, uh, so we now know uh, what H1 uh, and H2 are, uh, and we have expressed them in terms of this, uh, uh, the gravitational wave metric. So the next thing would be to insert those into uh, H1 uh, star H2, but we want to do this in the frequency domain, so we have to convert uh, HI uh, 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 or HAB into, um, uh, into the frequency domain. And uh, that takes us back to uh, using the plane wave expansion from, uh, from the Monday lecture. So uh, what we will do is we will write HI as a function of frequency. And I will add T here as a, uh, 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 as a reminder that we are doing the analysis um, uh, and we'll see this more uh, later uh, in segment by segment basis. So T will not be a continuous uh, variable anymore. It's basically just an index now telling me which, let's say, uh, minute long segment I'm, I'm analyzing. Um, so really the, the, the uh, HI here is a function of frequency and T is a kind of a counting uh, uh, index uh, variable which tells me which uh, uh, particular time segment we're, we're analyzing. So remember when we did the plane wave expansion, we had the sum over the polarizations. We had the integral over the uh, uh, sphere for different directions uh, of the wave propagation. We also had uh, uh, an integral over the frequency, but now uh, we are looking at the frequency uh, uh, um, uh, variable, frequency dependent variable H. So there is no need to, to do a frequency for a transform that's already been done. Uh, and then uh, what's inside of the integral is the amplitude H A, which is a function of the frequency and the direction omega hat. And A here is the polarization. So uh, it can be plus or cross. Uh, and then we have the, uh, uh, the uh, exponential uh, phase term, which is uh, two pi I uh, uh, F. Um, and I'm again, ignoring the, uh, uh, the uh, frequency Fourier transform. Uh, so the, the two pi IFT term uh, has already been applied. 
So what's left is the uh, spatial piece, which looks like uh, omega hat dotted with uh, the, the position x, and this will be the position of the, uh, of the vector i, xi, uh, divided by c. So if you look back at uh, the plane wave expansion nodes, you will see that the uh, expansion that the phase term there uh, look like uh, e to the two pi i f, and then in the brackets we had a time minus um, minus this omega dotted with uh, with the x. Um, the time part again we're ignoring here because we have already done the, the Fourier transform in, in frequency uh, for the frequency part. So we are really just doing the k part here, uh, which is captured by by this term. Then we also have to add the uh, the tensor. So um, we'll write this as um, uh, um, uh, uh, tensor polarization A. This is also a function of omega hat. Uh, uh, depends on the direction of the wave propagation. So that's the plane wave expansion. That's uh, that's this part here. That what I'm uh, uh, circling around. We need to also add the, or contract this with uh, the response of the detector. So with DAB, which is a function of time and the position of the detector XI. So that's the full expression. And uh, this part here, we will replace by uh, uh, one, one term. It will depend on the, uh, the uh, uh, polarization A. It will depend on uh, the uh, location of the detector xi. Uh, so I'll put, put that as, uh, as an index i. And it will depend on the uh, um, omega and on time. OK, so uh, this, this capital F quantity here uh, captures uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, contraction of a polarization tensor with uh, the detector response tensor. Uh, at a particular location given by xi and at a particular time. Okay, so this gives us then um, uh, uh, the expression for xi. Uh, and uh, uh, so we now have a plane wave expansion of the gravitational wave contracted with the detector response to give us the, uh, 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 the hi, the gravitational wave signal at the detector i in the frequency domain. Okay, I hope everybody is okay with this. So the, the next thing that we want to do is we want to take this and plug it inside of this expression. Uh, I'm circling it here again uh, to, to, uh, to basically calculate the expectation value of, um, of our estimator y. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, so we have h, uh, uh, H1 star of F with H2 of F prime. We want to calculate this uh, two point correlation. So doing the expansion from above for both of these will have a uh, sum over A and A prime. Both of them will, uh, will be plus and cross. And then we'll have two integrals, uh, one over omega and then another over omega prime. And then uh, let me uh, uh, write terms uh, 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 um, more strategically. So we'll have HA of F and omega. Uh, and this one will be starred as uh, is the first term. Um, and then uh, we will have the uh, phase factor. So this will be, uh, I will write it on the next line here as um, because we're complex conjugating, the minus becomes a plus in the exponent. Okay, so that's our phase factor. And then we'll have um, uh, the, uh, the F for this term. So we'll have F1 of A uh, uh, of omega and P. And then the next term, uh, so now we're uh, doing the uh, plane wave expansion of H2. So we'll have HA prime, uh, which is a function of F prime and omega prime, okay. We have the uh, exponential, which is uh, uh, has a minus two pi i f, and now it's uh, uh, the, the dot product is between omega prime and uh, the location of the second detector, which is x two uh, divided by c, and then finally the the f term, which is now f two uh, at at a prime, evaluated um, at omega prime and p. So let me see if I missed anything. Um, I think we're good. 
Now we're doing the expectation value on the left-hand side. We have to do the expectation value of the right-hand side and the expectation value is really just be, uh, uh, on this product of the two amplitudes because everything else uh, uh, is not a random variable, right? Uh, these are well-defined functions on the second line here. So, okay, so uh, we now know what to do, right? Because this is a two-point correlation between uh, two uh, uh, amplitudes of gravitational waves. So uh, if we have two waves propagating in directions uh, omega and omega prime at frequencies f and f prime, and uh, uh, at uh, of polarizations a and a prime, uh, what is the two-point correlation? Remember, we wrote that down on Monday. Um, the cross correlation will be zero if uh, these two waves have different polarizations, different directions, or different frequencies. Uh, and if they have the same frequencies, then uh, we will have some some uh, strain power associated with uh, with that particular wave. So, in other words, we can replace uh, uh, this two point correlation with uh, uh, several delta functions. So let me be explicit here and rewrite all of that. So we have the sum over a and a prime, we have integral over omega and omega prime. And then I'm replacing this two point correlation with uh, delta functions. So uh, the uh, polarizations have to be the same of the two gravitation waves. Um, the uh, frequencies have to be the same. The, uh, uh, the uh, directions uh, omega and omega hat, uh, omega hat and omega hat prime have to be the same. And if they are all the same, then this will be, uh, uh, one in the same wave and uh, its two point correlation or correlation with itself will be just the strain power, which is a function of, a, of frequency. That's, that was the assumption for the two point correlation we made on Monday and we're reusing it uh, today. And then we have uh, the same exponential uh, factors. Um, so I guess I will write all of that again. So give me a sec. Okay, so uh, the, the, the next steps are straightforward, right? Uh, the delta function, uh, the Kronecker delta between A and A prime will just force the sum over A prime to, to disappear. And uh, the delta function over uh, uh, omega and omega prime will uh, make one of the uh, uh, omega integrals disappear. And we can then force the uh, uh, omega prime to be equal to omega everywhere else everywhere else. So we will have uh, uh, the frequency delta function left over, we'll have h of f left over, and then in the exponent um, of the uh, of this um, uh, phase of these two phase factors, we'll have omega uh, prime replaced by omega. So we'll have two pi i f omega hat uh, dotted into delta x where delta x uh, uh, will be, I'll just write it here, delta x vector is just x1 minus x2. Okay, so that's the, delta x is the relative uh, vector, the, the, or the vector connecting two detectors um, locations, x1 and x2. Uh, and then the last term will be f1a uh, of omega t and uh, uh, f2a uh, of omega t. Um, all right, so um, uh, uh, I will uh, re rewrite this in a slightly different way, okay? Uh, what I will do is um, uh, I will take the h of f. We know how to express this in terms of omega of f, right? So let me write that out. So that, that was uh, 3h0 squared divided by 20 pi squared and f cubed times omega gw of f. That's, uh, that was uh, equal to the, to the strain, to the, uh, the strain power uh, h of f, okay? Uh, let me also uh, take the uh, delta function out of the, um, uh, out of the integral in the sum because it doesn't depend on, uh, of course, a or omega. And what's left is um, uh, uh, just this sum over a and the integral over, over omega of the exponential factor, e to the two pi i f omega hat dotted with delta x over c, 
and then F1 and F2. Uh, and both of them are, uh, I guess I'm being explicit now. All right, uh, so the reason I wrote it this way is because this quantity uh, is, uh, if, you, if you look at it, it's a purely geometric quantity, right? It, uh, it uh, 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 depends only on the relative uh, uh, locations uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the two detectors, right? And on their orientations, so which are kind of encoded inside of F1 and F2. So we will uh, write this as uh, uh, we'll label this uh, this collection of terms and this integral and the sum as uh, gamma one two, uh, which is a function of frequency. It's not a function of omega because omega is inter integrated over. It's not a function of the polarization either. It's only a function of the frequency uh, mm -hmm. and of uh, the detector uh, location one and two. Uh, can I ask one thing? Shouldn't that be thirty two instead of twenty? Oh, I may have made a mistake. Uh, uh, in my notes, I, uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, this should be 32. Uh, let me fix this. Yeah, this should be 32. And then, um, uh, uh, yeah, this, this is 32. Um, uh, I should be a little bit more careful because uh, the, this, uh, this gamma function that I defined, which we're going to call the overlap reduction function. Uh, uh, this actually has a prefactor as well of uh, uh, pi over, over eight, uh, sorry, five over eight pi. So uh, in the end, uh, this will look like three H zero squared over 20 uh, pi uh, squared and F cubed. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll have omega GW of F, uh, the delta function, and then the gamma function. Okay, so, so uh, uh, the, the gamma function, the overlap reduction function is not exactly just this term. It is this term multiplied by five over eight pi, which changes the 32 pi, uh, it should have been pi cubed in the, in the top line. So 32 pi cubed becomes 20 pi squared um, when you do that. The reason for this uh, prefactor of uh, five over eight pi is uh, so that if you have the same detector, if x1 and x2 are the same, the same vector, then you want gamma one, two to be exactly one. Uh, and that prefactor allows you allows you for that. Uh, so this is then the uh, the expectation value of H one star uh, H two uh, uh, two point correlation, right? Uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, this basically gives us uh, right away this, the sense that um, uh, correlating the uh, uh, the two detectors time series, and, and we'll, we'll make this a bit more explicit in a minute, but you can see that the two point correlation here is again related to omega, the gravitational wave energy density. Um, and uh, and that, that is really what we were after. We wanted to find a, a way of connecting the cross correlation to the energy density. And uh, this factor gamma here, the overlap reduction uh, is, we'll talk more about it uh, later, but basically it's a purely geometric factor that tells us um, how that particular uh, pair of detectors, uh, uh, how they, uh, how the gravitational wave signal is suppressed due to the fact that these two detectors are not on the same location. So uh, there's some time delay between uh, uh, gravitational waves uh, hitting one detector and the other. And that time delay will depend on the wave uh, direction, uh, on, on the wave propagation direction. And also the two detectors are pointing uh, effectively in different directions. They're on the surface of the earth. Uh, so they, their, their L shapes are uh, kind of pointing in different uh, directions on the sky. And, uh, uh, and that uh, basically amounts to an antenna pattern uh, 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 mismatch, if you like, between the two detectors and, and uh, reduces the sensitivity of the pair to uh, gravitational wave um, uh, background. 
So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, again, this is a purely geometric uh, factor, so you can calculate it. Uh, and it has been calculated for all uh, detector pairs uh, um, that exist today. Um, uh, so, um, you know, th there are papers uh, that you can read on, on how, how to actually do this calculation. It's a pretty messy calculation, I would say, um, and there's nothing intrinsically deep. So I won't go into that in that direction. Uh, just uh, be aware that uh, uh, gammas, the overlap reduction functions are uh, evaluated, they exist, and you can, you can look them up. Uh, all right, so um, I think we're, uh, we're good with that. Uh, so the, the, the last uh, connection that we want to make is to actually connect this to the expectation value of our estimator y. So uh, uh, remember that this was uh, given by the integral of df uh, and df prime minus infinity to infinity of uh, s1 star of f and s2 of f. And then there was, uh, sorry, f prime. And that there was a, a, a filter q, uh, which is a function of f prime. And there was a, a time, a finite time approximated uh, delta function uh, of f minus f prime. Okay, so uh, uh, since we said that, um, uh, just going back quite a bit at this point, I guess, um, uh, we're ignoring the, uh, uh, the n terms. So for s1 star s2, we're basically replacing it with h1 star h2, right? Uh, the, uh, the n1, n2, n1, h2, and h1, n2 terms are dropped. So we're just keeping the last H1, H2 term. Uh, and that gives us, um, so we can basically replace, uh, just to save myself some writing, um, I will replace S1 and S2 with H1 and H2. And I, we have just computed uh, in this uh, boxed uh, equation up, up, uh, up here, what that is, right? So we can, we can replace this with three H zero squared uh, divided by 20 uh, pi squared. And then we have these integrals uh, over F and F prime. And the two point correlation uh, looks like uh, omega GW of F divided by F cubed times uh, the delta function of F minus F prime times uh, gamma one, two. Then we have the filter at F prime and the finite time delta function, okay? So the next thing we can do is we can evaluate the inter integral over F prime. That's easy because we have a, a, a true delta function in here. So um, when we do that, we will have, again, the prefactor 3h squared over 20 pi squared. We'll have the integral over F, okay? Uh, we'll have omega GW of F over F cubed we'll have the gamma function gamma one, two of, uh, of F. We'll have the filter Q, which is now uh, forced to be uh, evaluated at F because of this delta function. And then we will have the, uh, 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 the finite time approximation of the delta function, which will now be evaluated at zero because F will be, uh, F prime will be forced to be equal to F by the other delta function. Uh, and uh, the uh, delta T evaluated as zero is equal to just uh, T as we saw before. So that gives me a factor of T or prefactor of T um, uh, here. So this is my final result. Um, the um, expected value of the cross correlation estimator as I defined it uh, uh, above is uh, directly related to uh, omega GW of F. So uh, it's directly related to, uh, sorry, this should have been uh, integral over, over F, not F prime. Uh, so it's directly related to, to what I want. So cross correlating two detectors, uh, time series, uh, moving then into frequency domain uh, allows me to, to estimate what the uh, uh, gravitational wave energy density is. Uh, of course, there are other things that show up here. This is, as we said, a geometric factor so that I can calculate. So I, if, this is a known quantity, gamma one, two is a known quantity. Uh, F cube, of course, of course is uh, um, uh, known and we're integrating over it. Uh, so what's not known yet is what is this Q? Uh, um, and uh, 
this is uh, this is one piece that's uh, uh, one of the two main pieces that are still to be determined. Um, the other piece that uh, has to be determined is what is the variance on this estimator uh, y. It's not enough to to uh, estimate just uh, y itself. We also want to know what is the error um, on uh, or the uncertainty on y. So the way we can uh, we can do this. Uh, so remember that the, the variance. <clears throat> is uh, uh, given by the expected value of y squared minus the expected value of y quantity squared. Um, and uh, we have already calculated the second term here, but we're going to assume uh, that this term is uh, uh, very small. Uh, so in, in other words, we're going to assume that the uh, uh, signal, the stochastic gravitation wave background itself is uh, much smaller than uh, the detector noise. So we'll, we'll assume that this term basically will be much smaller compared to uh, the first term. And for the first term, we have to, we're looking at the expectation value of, of y squared. So uh, we have to write, uh, uh, expand y in, in terms of frequencies and then uh, uh, square it, right? So this will, this will then have four frequency inter integrals. So there will be an integral over uh, f from minus infinity to infinity over f prime. And then for the squared, let's let's use uh, k and k prime as also frequency uh, uh, variables. And then here we'll have n1 uh, star of f times n2 of uh, f prime. Then we'll have uh, uh, n1 star of k, and we'll have n2 uh, of uh, k prime. Okay. And then we'll have the finite delta functions. So we'll have delta t uh, of f minus f prime and another one for the second term of in y, which will be uh, in terms of k and k prime. And then we'll have uh, the filter q uh, evaluated at f prime. That's from the first term of y. And then filter q evaluated k prime. That's from the second term uh, of y. So I hope you guys can follow what I'm doing here. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, just a single y is given by the double integral df df prime of uh, uh, n1 star of f n2 of f prime times the delta function f minus f prime and the filter q at f prime. That, this is uh, what we derived earlier in frequency domain for, for, uh, for y. And I'm now squaring that. So uh, I'm introducing K and K prime <clears throat> as additional frequency uh, 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 variables to integrate over. Hi, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. So uh, while calculating the sigma y square, uh, you neglected the second term, right? Yeah. You said the signal is very small. Uh, so you're saying that the expectation value represents the signal contribution? Yeah. But how do you interpret that y expectation value of y squared uh, corresponds to the noise? How yeah, so, yeah. So you, you're correct. What I should be doing is um, <clears throat> I should be writing s1, s2, s1, and s2 all, everywhere here, and not just n. Uh, and then I will have many terms because s1 can be written as n1 plus h1, and s2 is n2 plus h2, and so on, right? So there will be many terms here. Uh, some some of these terms will have uh, <clears throat> will have correlations between n and h, so those will go away. Uh, other terms will have uh, odd power of n uh, uh, in there, and those will also average out to zero. Uh, so really, the only term that that will survive is the term that has um, uh, 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 basically all four terms uh, being n's. Okay, so we're assuming <clears throat> several things here. We're assuming that uh, uh, the variables are, variables are Gaussian, which means that, um, uh, and we're assuming that n uh, has much larger noise, uh, much larger power than, uh, than h. So the dominant term would then be uh, the term that only involves the, the n's. So th that's where this comes from. So you're, you're absolutely right. I should have been more careful and uh, I should have written S1 and S2 instead of N1 and N2. But then when I expand each S into N plus H, uh, 
most most of the terms will be basically uh, uh, neglectable because uh, uh, they will involve uh, uh, one or more powers of H, which we are going to assume uh, are are much smaller than than n in in, in power. Okay, that clears it out. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for raising that up. I should have been a bit more careful. Um, so. Uh, the, the next thing that I will do here is uh, um, I will uh, use the fact that, uh, um, uh, uh, so uh, I will use the fact that uh, the noise in time domain is real, which means that, <clears throat> that uh, N, uh, uh, sorry, so N uh, one, let's say of, um, of uh, uh, K, star will be equal to n1 of minus k. Okay, this comes from the fact that n1 is, uh, um, is real in time domain. Uh, so in frequency domain, which uh, this, uh, this is uh, uh, denoted by k here, um, uh, means that uh, if I complex conjugate uh, the uh, uh, n1, uh, that's equivalent to basically evaluating it at minus k. Uh, that co comes from the reality of, uh, of uh, n and one in time domain. So I can then change this. Again, I have um, the four integrals. Um, and uh, um, I can write this as n one star of f times uh, n one of minus k times uh, n two of uh, um, I should uh, write this as n2 star here of minus f prime and n2 of k prime, okay? Uh, and then the same delta, delta terms, delta t of f minus f prime, uh, delta t of k minus k prime, uh, q at f prime and q at k prime. Um, now, the, the next thing that I will do is uh, I will assume that uh, n1 and n2 uh, are statistically independent uncorrelated uh, uh, variables, which allows me to split this four point correlation into a product of two point correlations. So uh, uh, I don't know if you've noticed uh, what I just did, but I, uh, I have converted the, uh, the four point correlation here. And I added these two expectation value brackets uh, to indicate that uh, um, because N1 and N2 are, are um, uh, statistically independent uh, variables, uh, I can split this in, uh, uh, into a product of two two-point correlations. And this is a result uh, that's appropriate for Gaussian uh, uncorrelated variables, uh, comes from statistics. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, uh, you, know, you can look it up or take it as a given uh, for, for the moment. Um, and um, uh, and then uh, the next step for us will be to, to deal with these two point correlations in noise. So uh, if I have Ni star uh, at some frequency F and Ni at uh, some frequency F prime, this two point, point correlation function will be our definition of the uh, noise power spectrum. Okay, so we will write this as uh, one half delta function between uh, F and F prime and uh, we will multiply this by the noise power spectrum pi, which is a function of frequency. And to be explicit, uh, this will be a, a function of the uh, uh, only positive frequencies. So hence uh, the, the factor of one half uh, out front. This here is the noise uh, power spectrum uh, of our detector, uh, uh, detector I. Um, all right, so we are now uh, ready. We can, uh, we can impose this, uh, replace the uh, two-point correlation functions uh, uh, upstairs with, uh, with our power spectra. So the sigma y squared uh, then becomes uh, the integral uh, from minus infinity to infinity over all four of these variables still. Okay, and then uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, uh, the first uh, two-point correlation gets replaced by one-half times the delta function, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice here, um, between F and a K, so that would be a plus here. And uh, similarly, we'll have another delta function between uh, 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 K prime and, 
uh, let's see what did I do here? Yeah, f prime and uh, and k prime, uh, and then we'll have the p's p uh, p one uh, evaluated at f, and that's an absolute f, and p two evaluated at absolute uh, f prime. And then the, then we, we have the same uh, second, uh, second row. So the time approximated delta functions f minus f prime and k minus k prime, uh, q evaluated f prime and q evaluated at k prime. Okay, so I think that's, that's all of it. So now uh, let's, uh, let's see what happens. We can uh, evaluate the integrals over k and k prime uh, and use these two delta functions uh, to do it. So we have uh, a, a quarter out front uh, coming from these two factors of uh, one half. Uh, we have the two integrals uh, remaining over f and f prime. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, so then we have uh, P1 uh, evaluated at f, that's still there. P2 evaluated at f prime, absolute f prime, still there. Uh, now we have two delta functions, uh, time approximated. Both of them look like f minus f prime. So I'll put a square here. And we have q uh, squared evaluated at f prime. Uh, and uh, as the last step, uh, I'm going to make an approximation here which is uh, I will uh, approximate one of these delta functions. Uh, there are two, of, two uh, time, uh, finite time approximated delta functions here. I will assume that one of them uh, is, or approximate one of them to be uh, uh, the real delta function. So when I do the integral over f prime, it will force uh, f, f equal to f prime. So what I will have then is one quarter integral over df from minus infinity to infinity We'll have P1 evaluated at F. P2, now uh, F prime is being forced to be equal to F by uh, evaluating this, um, uh, the, the one of these two delta functions. Uh, similarly, we'll have uh, Q uh, squared also evaluated at F. And, uh, uh, and we're left with one, uh, with, a, uh, with a second uh, uh, finite time delta function, which is evaluated at F minus F. Or, or at zero, which gives me a factor of t. So uh, I put a factor of t out uh, in front of the uh, in front of the integral. So this is my uh, approximation for sigma y squared. Okay, uh, and you can see that uh, it's it's proportional to the noise power spectra uh, of the two detectors p1 and p2, and to to this filter q, which we still haven't determined. Um, so we now have expressions for both uh, y hat. Uh, we, we know what the expectation value is. Here it is. And we have uh, the, ex the uh, expression for uh, the variance on this uh, quantity. And uh, uh, as you see, it depends basically on the PSDs, the power spectral densities of the two uh, detectors. All right, so the last task we have is to figure out what is Q, okay? And uh, there is a very nice trick uh, that uh, Alan, uh, Bruce Allen and Joe Romano have come up with um, uh, to do this um, and um, uh, to figure out what is the optimal uh, filter that we should be using. So they define uh, inner product, okay? Uh, so if I have uh, two functions A and B, the inner product of them will be the integral. These are both functions of frequency. The, uh, it will be the integral over frequency from minus infinity to infinity of uh, A star of F, B of F times uh, P1 of F and uh, P2 of F. Okay, so this is just a definition. You can verify uh, that this is indeed uh, 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 following the rules of inner products and so on. Um, and uh, with this definition, the uh, the expected value of y. Okay, so uh, if if we uh, look back at what that looks like, almost there. 
So you see that uh, uh, we can think of this as a, as a dot product of uh, this filter Q and something else. This something else will have omega, we will have uh, gamma, it will have F cubed in the denominator. And uh, since the inner product also has P1 and P2 multiplying um, uh, uh, this in, in, inside the integrand, we have to divide by them in the, uh, 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 in the denominator here as well. So uh, in other words, uh, just to be explicit, we can write the expected value of Y uh, there is this prefactor of uh, 3h0 squared p divided by 20 pi squared. And then we have the inner product between q and uh, uh, what I just enumerated. So there, there will be omega gw of f, there will be uh, uh, gamma, the overlap reduction function of f, there'll be f cubed in the denominator, and then there will be p1 of f and p2 of f. Uh, and I should should be more uh, careful, but uh, all of these will basically be positive uh, 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 frequencies. So we can we can think of these as uh, absolute values. Similarly, uh, if you look at um, uh, sigma, uh, you can see that uh, this is already in in the form of the inner product. It's uh, the inner product of Q and with itself, because that will give us Q squared times. If, if I put Q and Q here, that will give me Q squared P1, P2, which is exactly what I have uh, in the variance here. So we can write uh, sigma Y squared as uh, T over four times the inner product of Q of F with itself. Okay. Um, so uh, the SNR or SNR squared is given by uh, Y squared divided by sigma Y squared. So that will look like uh, um, uh, we'll have three H zero squared over 20 pi squared, the whole thing squared again. We'll have another factor of T and then we'll have this Q, uh, inner product of Q with omega GW uh, gamma one, two divided by FQ P one P two divided by the inner product of Q with itself. And we want to maximize this. We want to have the maximum SNR uh, we can get. And you, you, you can maximize this SNR if you force this quantity to be your filter. So uh, SNR is maximized uh, when, um, when Q of F is equal to omega GW of F times uh, gamma one, two of F. And again, I'm assuming that these are all positive frequencies divided by F cube uh, times uh, P one of F, P two of F. Okay, I think uh, uh, this is what we wanted to do. And uh, yes, we can, we can also add a scaling factor lambda out front. So this is our optimal filter. Uh, this choice of Q uh, maximizes the signal to noise ratio for the estimator Y uh, that we have defined. So we're, we're basically done. Uh, uh, we, can, we can go back and uh, figure out what is the SNR. Um, so we can plug in this filter Q into the expression for the SNR and uh, simplify and so on. And you can see that this ends up being 380 squared times the square root of T divided by 10 pi squared. And then we have the uh, uh, integral uh, over the frequency. And uh, uh, this is omega GW of F uh, times uh, gamma one, two squared of F divided by, uh, sorry, this should be squared as well, uh, divided by F uh, to the power six, uh, P1 of F and P2 of F and to be Perfectly clear, I should really put all of these in absolute values um, because we're using just the positive frequencies here. And then the whole thing uh, is uh, under the square root. So this is our signal to noise uh, ratio. Uh, I, yes. I have a question. Uh, so in the in the expression for SNR, you have gamma one two, the over, overlap reduction function, right? And gamma one two itself has the antenna pattern function for both the detectors, the F1 and the F2s. So yeah. there's also some sort of time dependence there, right? 
the uh, f1 is not only omega it's also omega and t a function of omega and t so uh, yeah. how how do you factor in that dependence here like i don't see that being averaged out yet yeah so that that's a uh, that's a very good uh, question so uh, the answer is a little bit complicated uh, so uh, if if we did um, uh, if we if we take our data uh, let's say we take one year of data and uh, uh, just take the entire uh, time series of one year long uh, uh, data. When we do the Fourier transform, uh, there is no time dependence whatsoever anymore. So uh, if, if we did the analysis that way, uh, there, the, the time will not show up anywhere else. Uh, we, we don't do it this way uh, uh, in part because we partly because we, we can't do Fourier transform with such a long time series, but also partly because we want to uh, capture the, 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 the changes in the detector response as a function of time. So we do the analysis in small, uh, uh, in, in small uh, segments, uh, in small time segments, typically one minute long or uh, 192 seconds long. Um, uh, so we would, uh, we would do the Fourier transforms within each minute uh, uh, segment. And um, so within each minute, uh, there is no time dependence, right? Uh, you, if you take a minute of data, you do the Fourier transform, there is no time dependence in, in that analysis anymore. So you can proceed with the analysis of that one minute of data, uh, ignoring the time dependence altogether. So the question then uh, becomes, uh, how are uh, results from minute one related to minute two? Uh, and should I expect any difference in uh, in in y um, if uh, uh, between the the time segment one and time segment two? And the answer is no. On average, you don't expect to see any difference between them because you are you're looking at the uh, um, at the isotropic background. So uh, on average, uh, in minute one and minute two, you should be observing the same uh, strain power. Okay, uh, uh, regardless of uh, uh, how the detectors are oriented, if the background is truly isotropic, you should be observing the same strain power in uh, uh, both minute one and minute two, segment one and segment two. Uh, now, if the background is not isotropic, then that, that breaks down. Uh, and in fact, uh, so what we will do uh, next is uh, uh, we will, try to extend this analysis to anisotropic backgrounds, and we will actually take advantage of this time dependence uh, that you mentioned to, uh, to, to uh, measure the anisotropy in the stochastic background. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah it does. Thanks. Okay, uh, Daresh, can you just ask your question? Because it's not clear where the factor four you're referring to. Uh, sorry, uh, factor of four? Yeah. This Somebody is uh, this about a factor of four. This factor of four. No, uh, in the SNI square term, yeah, you, you missed a factor of four. There should be four by t instead, of, uh, like four t instead of just t. Ah, you have t uh, by t. Let, me, let me double check. Uh, did I mess up? Um, yeah, I did mess up. Uh, I should have written this as a 10, not as a 20. Sorry about that. Uh, I was. Uh, just copying from my notes and I missed that. I have one more hey. question. If we have yes, go, go ahead, please. Uh, so for the final expression for the SNR, um, of course we would like the SNR to increase as we decrease the PSD and they appear in the denominator. So that seems to be happening, but as we increase, as we decrease uh, the PSDs, uh, equivalently as we increase the sensitivity, uh, omega gw itself might be decreasing because we are removing more and more sources from the background because they are individually resolvable. So if we consider also omega gw um, to be a function of P1 and P2 in the sense that we will be removing sources um, when they are individually resolvable, is it still clear why the SNR will be increasing uh, as you decrease the PSDs? Uh, 
No, so you're, you're absolutely right. So uh, just to be clear, uh, you are talking about uh, the, uh, the uh, background due to compact binaries, uh, which, yeah. uh, you, which of course we can individually detect and potentially subtract uh, before we look for the stochastic background. And you're absolutely right uh, that uh, in, in that case, uh, we have a moving target. Uh, we, uh, as we improve the sensitivity, we can detect more of the individual sources and there is less, uh, 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 less residual uh, stochastic background uh, after we remove those individual sources. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right that this is indeed the case. Uh, it turns out um, that it's not a huge effect because um, the, uh, in that particular model, most of the uh, uh, stochastic background amplitude comes from uh, things that are at the redshifts of one or two. So uh, in the present day, uh, with the present uh, sensitivities of LIGO and Virgo and so on, as they, as they keep improving, they will, uh, 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 they will detect, of course, more individual sources, but they're still in the, range, in the redshift range of 0.1 or so. Uh, so we're not, uh, when we remove those individual sources, we're not really removing a huge fraction of the stochastic background power. So the effect is not huge yet. Uh, when we get to third generation detectors, uh, now we're talking about detectors that will be able to detect black hole binaries effectively everywhere in the universe and binary neutron stars out to redshifts of something like two, I think. Uh, there you're actually now in a position where you can subtract basically everything. Uh, 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 at least in theory, you can subtract a huge fraction of, of the uh, CBCs there uh, you, uh, you would have very little left in terms of the um, uh, stochastic background due to binaries, but that's actually a good thing because with those, mo with those detectors, then you might actually be able to uh, probe other non-CBC uh, stochastic backgrounds like uh, perhaps the early universe models. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'll just add, uh, you, have, you have mentioned a couple of things that I, I wanted to mention as well. Uh, um, the P's, uh, the noise power spectra show up in the denominator. So we are uh, um, de-weighing frequencies um, that are, are noisy. So for example, very low frequencies where the seismic noise dominates or 60 Hertz peaks uh, and their harmonics, which is our power mains in the U United States all of those uh, will have relatively large P's and they will naturally be suppressed uh, when, we, when we do the, the integral here over, over frequency. I should have, sorry, that there is a DF here as well. Um, so uh, uh, the, the P's uh, uh, naturally suppress the, the noisy frequencies uh, from, from the analysis. And as the detector sensitivity increases and the P's drop, uh, the SNR will increase. The other thing that you also see here is this factor of F cubed. Uh, it's F to the power of six, but it's under a square root. So it's really F cubed, um, which uh, it goes to what I said before. We really want to work at low frequencies because at low frequencies, this F cubed factor really helps us and uh, gives us sensitivity to, to omega. And the last thing I wanna mention is uh, that in the SNR, omega shows up. Uh, and that might be surprising here. Uh, how can the, uh, 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 the, the, the gravitational wave background itself be uh, 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 impact the SNR uh, since I don't know what this background is a priori. And really the way to think about this is that this is a, uh, an assumption. When we write down what the filter is, this Q, we have to guess what the uh, uh, gravitational wave energy density looks like. Uh, so this is an assumption that goes into the analysis. If I'm looking for the CBC stochastic background, I will assume uh, the F to the power two thirds functional form. Uh, if I'm looking for maybe cosmological backgrounds, I might choose F to the power zero because most of the cosmological models tend to be flat in our, in our band or, or close to flat. So um, uh, when we do the isotropic search, we have to make an assumption of what we think the background should be, uh, uh, what, what nature is giving us. And then for, for, for that assumption, this Q is the optimal Q that we can use to, to search for it. Okay, 
So uh, uh, we're way past uh, past time. So uh, we'll stop here. And uh, if there are any other questions, uh, um, uh, I had one question. So yesterday you described these uh, power law integrated curves. Can we see that uh, in a straightforward manner from the expression of the SNR? Um, can you see it in a straightforward way? Uh, I don't think so. Um, so. Uh, let me think a little bit about that and see if I can if I can make it make it uh, a, a, a simple extrapolation. Maybe I'll get back to you tomorrow. But uh, basically, what what you would do here is um, uh, the way those are calculated is you would assume a different power law uh, here, uh, and uh, you will then uh, find the SNR as a functional frequency. And you will pick out uh, the uh, the most sensitive frequency. Okay, and then you will repeat that for all the alphas, so different uh, alpha values, and uh, that will give you a set of points that that effectively traces out the PI curve. So, um, yeah, I don't see a very intuitive way of. Uh, you know, going from 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 this line here to the PI curve, but that's that's the construct. Okay, yeah, I, I think I understand. So basically, what you're trying to say is, uh, for omega GW, you assume a form f bar alpha, and then for each alpha, you will pick out the f which has which gives you the most SNR. Yeah, is that right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, and then that's and this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, also one one more small question. Uh, how would you formulate estimators for um, a network of, let's say, three or four or five detectors? Uh, so you would uh, you would basically do uh, do this, right? So you would uh, 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 you would basically do this. So you will calculate, you will create uh, an estimator for each pair, and then do a weighted sum over all pairs of detectors. Uh, can't we write, let's say, something like a three-point function there then? Oh, that's that's a very interesting question, I, uh, at least to my mind. Uh, so, a three-point correlation uh, of Gaussian variables is necessarily zero, right? It has an right. odd number of ends, or right. uh, and so on. So, so that doesn't work. Uh, if you had four detectors, you could uh, imagine using a four-point correlation. And uh, in the Allen Romano paper, they have actually investigated that, and they found that uh, a two-point correlation does better. Um, so, so uh, uh, several pairs of two-point correlations added in the, uh, together, combined together in this in this particular way. Um, uh, um, but uh, it, it is worth thinking a little bit more about. Uh, um, and and every once in a while, I get back to this question because it it, it keeps nagging me uh, that that uh, um, if you have multiple detectors, you should be able to combine them in in in, in something other than. Uh, multiple pairs. Um, but so far, I haven't been able to uh, <laughs> pinpoint that particular uh, a way that works better than this. Also, I mean, I guess if there, there are non-Gaussian features, then these three and four, five, etc., would be become important, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, in that case, uh, so th those correlations will then allow you to uh, identify uh, the non-Gaussianity, they will also allow you to identify uh, um, uh, 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 situations where maybe two detectors are correlated, but they're not correlated with the, the third one or something like that, you know. Uh, uh, so so you, could, you could certainly uh, uh, think about higher order correlations uh, to, to fight that kind of uh, data problems. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we had a fairly long session. So thanks, Luke, for your patience. Yeah, yeah, of course. My pleasure. Yeah. So I think we can close the session today. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow.